says it's recording. Okay. Uh, I'm going to hit record too, just in case. Oh, request permission from the test. Okay. Well, let's assume it's recording. All right. So uh, last time we said we were going to um, cover how to install Zoe Sketchbook. Um, I investigated the Windows instructions uh, for Kevin. And uh, Kevin, that looks pretty difficult. Um, I got it started on my own computer, but we're going to have to, um, I think, have a personalized Windows session in the near future for that. Um, okay. So most of our instructions are for um, are for people who have the Mac OS. Um, so we'll try to walk through that. Um, so let's all go to the getting started instructions. Um, so uh, was anyone able to uh, start the installation process? It's it's okay if not. We'll start at the beginning. Yeah. Oh, some, some people were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. And how far did you guys get? Uh, all, all went through. Yeah. All the way? Yeah, same. Cool, cool. Okay. Not, not me, because Homebrew doesn't work on Windows. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're on Windows as well? Okay, sorry. Um, so for Windows, let me, let me go back to that. Um, so there are two things that you should have installed uh, for Windows. Is uh, There's a Windows installer for Node. And then um, you should have get installed. And uh, that's as far as I got. Uh, so we'll have to try to debug that offline. Yeah, I got as far as uh, getting the repository up in uh, Visual Studio Code. OK. But then when I tried to run the test, I got an error one. OK. Yeah, well, um, that error should actually be pretty helpful. So we'll make sure to get that and uh, try to get you further. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, for those of you that were able to install, uh, were you able to run the test too and that successfully passed? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Perfect, so uh, in that case, um, let's go into the uh, smart contract examples that we have if that's okay for everyone. I'm very sorry for the Windows folks. So um, in, uh, if you did install everything correctly, you should have this locally in VS Code, um, but I'm just gonna show this uh, on the website um, so that everyone can take a look at it. Um, so in our examples directory, uh, we have the, the Baytown Bucks example that we went over last time, which is kind of like the ERTP example, right? And then we have this uh, trade with atomic swap example that we, I think we, um, we talked about a little bit, but not in depth because it needed to be updated uh, to the latest versions of ERTP and Zoe. Um, so let's, let's start by going over that. Um, so I probably need to make this larger. Uh, can everyone see this? Okay. Um, so what the atomic swap is doing is it's, uh, it's taking Alice's digital assets and Bob's digital assets. And they, th what they want to do is they just want to trade those, right? So all it's doing is just swapping Alice's assets for, uh, Bob's assets. And, um, so the code that we have here is really just using that atomic swap contract and executing it. Um, so I'll try to, you guys are kind of our guinea pigs, so I'm going to try to go over um, how Zoe is working and how the users are able to um, uh, talk to Zoe and what the users are doing. But uh, feel free to stop me if you have questions. Um, I'm sure it's not going to be very clear. We're actually working through the documentation for this right now. So Tom, Tom is actually um, our documenter. He's uh, he's the TYG person there. So. Uh, Tom and I are working on this documentation right now. So, um, and so what, what, let me let me do emphasize that if you do have any questions yeah. or miss or aren't sure you're understanding something, please ask about it because that'll be very useful for everyone else if we get a feel for what people have issues with. Right. Okay. So uh, let's start from Alice's perspective. Um, so what Alice is going to want to do is uh, she, let's say that Alice is the one that's actually starting this contract off. So um, Alice already has the atomic swap code 
because we, Agoric, have written it and uh, anyone can install that and use it. So Alice is starting off with um, what we call an installation for that atomic swap. And uh, so let me try to go into what that is. Um, and this is, this is one of the things that Tom and I have been working on. So an installation, uh, let's see if I can go into the documentation for this. So um, an installation is really just saying, hey, there's this contract code and we're gonna tell Zoe about it. And uh, so we're gonna upload this code to Zoe. And then what, what we're gonna get is this ID back that we call the installation handle. And um, so you might think of like, you know, normally we think of an ID as like a number or a string or something like that. But this ID is an opaque object. This is uh, something that's kind of particular to Agoric is that we prefer using JavaScript objects as uh, unique identifiers because they can't be forged. So someone, um, someone can't ever guess this identity um, because in JavaScript you can't, um, what's a good way to put this? Uh, you can't uh, just uh, create an object that would have the same identity. So um, I'm sure you guys probably have questions about that. We can, we can try to work that out, but um, okay. So, so you have this code that you wanna install. So you, you call zoe.install with this code and that gives you this opaque identifier, this installation handle. And then um, once you wanna create a contract instance, so you wanna actually run this contract and be able to use it, and you can create many instances for the same installation, um, then you use this installation handle to be able to do that. Okay, so back in our uh, example code here, so this is, this is what Alice is doing. Um, we started her off, with an installation handle for the atomic swap. That's, uh, that's what this is. And she's gonna make an instance. Um, so does, does the instance installation uh, separation make sense? Maybe? <laughs> okay, uh, we, can, we can come back to that. Okay, so um, Zoe needs to, needs to know what type of uh, what kind of ERTP assets you're gonna be talking about. So um, the way that you tell Zoe the kind of thing that you're going to be talking about with this contract is through the use of a, a issuer keyword record. Um, so this also needs better documentation, but um, effectively what you're saying is that um, in this atomic swap contract, we're gonna call one type of thing the asset, and we're gonna call another type of thing the price, so um, in this case, the asset is going to be Moolah and the price is gonna be in simoleons. These are two just uh, fake currencies that we came up with uh, for this test. And uh, so what we're doing is that we're telling Zoe about the issuers using the names price and asset uh, to do so. And um, price and asset are what we call keywords. Um, they, they have some unique characteristics, so they have to be, uh, they have to have a capital first letter and uh, they have to be ASCII. So we can't have weird characters in there. These are for security purposes so that someone can't use this to um, put some specific uh, characters in there that would uh, provide an attack vector. Um, so we'll, we'll go into how the, uh, the keyword records are used in a bit. Um, so uh, when Alice wants to create this instance, she also has to create what we call a proposal. And that was uh, previously what we called the offer rules. Um, so Alice is going to say, I'm going to give three moolah. That's the asset, right? And uh, the price for this asset is going to be seven simoleons. Okay, and then uh, Alice's exit rule. So these are the conditions under which she can, um, her offer can be completed, is that uh, she wants to be able to exit on demand. So she's gonna have the ability to actually cancel this offer. Um, so in order to make this offer with, uh, with Zoe, she has to submit a payment for what she said she was gonna give. So she withdraws a payment um, of three moolah and labels that under the asset uh, keyword. And these payments are submitted as part of the, um, 
part of making our offer. So to make an offer, you have to redeem an invite, you have to submit a proposal, and you have to submit the payments uh, that go along with that proposal. Um, and when Alice, um, oh, let's see, let's, uh, let's explain the invite. Um, so Alice got this invite uh, when she made the Zoe contract instance. Um, so um, this is kind of, you can think of it as kind of like the admin um, authority or something like that. When you, when you create a, a contract instance, um, you get an invite that you can use um, with Zoe to be able to interact with that contract. Um, so that's how Alice got that invite. And then when she redeems that invite with the proposal and the payments, she gets um, a seat and a payout. And this payout is going to be um, the payments that she gets back. So when the contract um, tries to match her offer with Bob's offer, she's going to get what Bob put in and Bob's going to get what she put in. Hey, could you yeah. explain um, redeem again? Yeah. Yeah. So we're actually, we're in the, um, we're in the middle of renaming this just to offer because this is the step of making, making an offer. But uh -huh. um, in order to participate in any contract, you have to have an invite to that contract and an invite is an ERTP payment. Um, and so um, as part of the offer step, you need to have that invite and actually send it in to Zoe. And what Zoe will do is it, it'll check that it's a valid invite and it will um, destroy that ERTP payment or what we call burn in kind of the cryptocurrency blockchain world. Okay. Um, so that's, that's effectively saying um, you have the correct authority to be able to interact with this contract. And I know that you have that permission because you have an invite uh, to the contract and it's a valid invite. So that, that's um, part of our uh, access control model. So you either have the invite because you made it or because you get it from somebody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, some of our contracts have a way to be able to uh, get an invite um, without getting it from anyone. The contract just allows you to say, hey, I wanna participate. Um, so for instance, there's a, uh, a, a decentralized exchange um, uh, that has an order book and they don't care who's interacting. Um, you know, if you have a valid order, you have a valid order. So you can, you can get an invite without having to get it from anyone. But yeah, most of the time that's exactly right. Okay, so um, let's look at it from, um, from Bob's perspective. So in this case, um, Alice makes, um, when she, when she puts her assets in, uh, she gets an invite, she gets a, an invite to match that first uh, offer. So um, she's going to send this invite to Bob. So we can look at uh, Bob's perspective. And I think a lot of this will become clear once we actually see the contract code, but I want to kind of outline how the users interact with it first. So just quick, just quickly. So uh, her sending, our sending the offer to Bob is at the end there. Um, just that make first offer and that does the send that um, then Bob can see? Uh, partially. So um, this uh, make first offer is actually making the new invite for Bob for, through the contract. Okay. And so um, uh, that's what we're labeling as Bob invite P. Um, P is kind of our internal language for saying that something is a promise. Um, so if you see the suffix P, that, that means it's a promise. Oh, okay. um, we can definitely make that clear. And then this, um, this wallet mechanism is saying, um, uh, this is Alice's wallet. So it's saying the thing that you have a name for under Bob, um, send this invite uh, to Bob. Um, and so the, the namespace for um, people here for Bob and Alice is that within Zoe, those names, that's, so that's the name. Um, yeah, so this is, um, this is the concept of a pet name. 
So um, in a pet name system, each, um, each entity, each person is able to have their own names for things. So instead of there being a centralized uh, registry, like, you know, like um, domain names or something like that, or like radio spectrum allocation, um, this is, um, I, you know, it's kind of like your, um, your phone book or um, hmm. not phone book, but um, uh, your contact list in your phone is what I mean. Um, so, you know, I, I have names, I have my own personal names for everyone, but the phone number itself is the um, objective reference, but I have my own subjective names. So um, Alice can so, have whatever name for Bob that she wants. And what is the objective reference for Bob? Um, Does so, it touch to that? Yeah, yeah. So um, through our object capability model, most of the time there is no um, public reference for, for things. Most of the times things are, um, you don't have access to something unless someone grants you access to a specific object. But um, we do have a mechanism called uh, the registry or the registrar that allows you to say, hey, this object that I have, I wanna make it publicly accessible to everyone and I'm gonna give it the string identifier so I can tell someone about it. So, um, so most of the time everything is private and there, there is no um, um, kind of shelling point. There is no common knowledge of, you know, this is the thing that we're talking about, but we do have a, me a mechanism to enable that. Sure. Okay. Um, so let's go to Bob's perspective. And uh, let's see. So Bob is getting this invite here from, um, from Alice. And uh, the first thing that he's gonna wanna do is he's gonna want to um, check the invite to see that it's, uh, it's valid. So he gets this invite issuer from Zoe. Um, so this is a public uh, method that Zoe has is to get the invite issuer. And in, um, in ERTP, the issuer um, is, the uh, decider of the validity of the kinds of things that it um, is associated with. So if I have a type of digital asset um, and I know the issuer for that, I can ask the issuer, hey, is this a valid kind of that sort of thing? So um, the Zoe invite issuer is, has the final say over whether an invite is a valid invite or not. Um, and any methods that I call on the invite issuer that use this invite um, will error if it's not a valid invite. So I can say, you know, give me the amount of this invite and that'll, that'll give me some more information about what this invite is. Um, part of the amount of an invite has the, uh, the installation handle that we talked about uh, earlier. And so what Bob can do is he can look up that installation handle and uh, he can check whether it matches his known installation handle for the atomic swap code. And if it doesn't, he can throw an error and you know, tell Alice that she's uh, you know, going back on their agreement and messing with him and that sort of thing, right? Um, he can also check the, the underlying issuers um, for this contract. So we said earlier that um, you know, the type of thing that we're calling an asset is gonna be the moolah kind. The type of thing that we're calling a price is going to be simoleons. Um, so you can do that check as well. And if he's satisfied with those things, um, then he can go ahead and make his offer in the same way that um, Alice did. So that takes an invite, um, which he got from Alice. His intended uh, offer rules are what we now call the proposal, um, which you can see is just the flip side of Alice, right? So he's, um, he's giving the simoleons and he wants the moolah. And this is the exact opposite of what Alice was wanting and giving. And uh, his uh, payments. So he's going to be paying uh, the seven simoleons. And so um, he also does that redeem step or that offer step. And then um, when, um, when Alice has put in her offer and uh, Bob has put in his offer and the contract sees that both of them match, that's when um, this promise, so in, in JavaScript, um, there's the concept of a promise that is a, um, it uh, is a, let's see, what's a good way to put this? It's a value that will be resolved at a future time. So um, 
when this promise uh, resolves to a value, that's when that payout actually happens and uh, the users will get their, their ERTP payments, which um, in this case, Bob will deposit in his wallet. So let's actually, let's actually go into the code because I think that will help clarify things. And are there any questions in the meantime? So, so this is just a, a trade. So mm -hmm. the, you know, if they were negotiating this and putting these promises in to Zoe with uh, escrowed amounts, mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think about how that would work. So how would I, so I would make a promise and you would look at it, decide if you like it, and then return with a alternative promise? Yeah, um, so we, we don't have an example of negotiation happening within Zoe right now, right. But, um, but you could imagine it being handled a couple of different ways. Um, so the first way is that, um, the negotiation is happening um, in some other communication channel. So it could be that, you know, uh, you and I are talking on Zoom, working out the details. And then when we finally decide, we do this atomic swap contract or you yeah. know, it could be any other medium, or it could be um, the negotiation could be part of this contract uh, as well. Um, we, you would have to write the contract to allow for that. And we don't have anything that, that would allow for that right now, but, um, but there's nothing preventing that. And um, what you would what you would have to do is have the contract kind of act as the storage of okay this offer you know or this proposed offer was made was it accepted or was a counter proposal made you know that that sort of thing um, yeah. and um, Dean uh, Dean our CEO kind of wrote up a, a state uh, diagram of you know that sort of thing back in the original. Um, Amex uh, American Information Exchange smart contract uh, platform like back in the 90s. So right. that, that sort of concept does exist, but we haven't tried to write it out as a contract, but that would be a great step or a, a great thing to add. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was trying to get a sense of how things get created and how they get destroyed. Mm -hmm. Permanently. So when I, if I was in an offer counter offer system, I'd have to, I'd have to show I have the simoleons to make that offer. Uh, but then if you wanted to counter that offer would somehow have to be destroyed. So the purse I created or whatever for that offer would then no longer exist or would get returned to me or something like that, I guess. Yeah, so, so I think there's the question of cheap talk, right? So right. Um, um, if someone doesn't mind the transaction cost of negotiation, then all of the, all of the negotiation could be um, uh, just done by, you know, through uh, text, basically, without actually putting up any assets. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have a contract that requires people to put up some kind of collateral before any negotiation starts. And then if, you know, if there's misbehavior, the collateral is lost or, you know, maybe the collateral is exactly the kind of thing that they would be using in the trade. Maybe it's not. Okay. You know I mean? Yeah. If I'm, if I'm recalling correctly, the uh, proposal slash offer includes uh, how the user can cancel the offer. So users could potentially cancel the offer. So, um, I'm thinking something like, I make an offer, I get back an email or a text saying, uh, no, we're not going to take that one. And then you'd cancel that offer and make a, a higher one or something like that. Would that work? Yeah, yeah, you could definitely do that. It's a bit, um, it, it really depends on whether you need Zoe for that step or not. Um, whether, whether you need to be escrowing at the point that, that you're negotiating or whether the um, negotiation is cheap enough that you can do it without having to, to escrow. But yeah, that's also another mechanism. Right, okay. Um, so, okay, so this is um, the 
atomic swap contract code. Um, so let's see. I think um, the first thing to explain is what happens when um, when Alice creates a contract instance. So this is the code that's identified by that installation handle. So if you were to give someone an installation handle and say, you know, um, you can use Zoe to look up this code, this is what that person would see for the most part. Um, so if anyone's inviting you to a contract, you can use that to see exactly what, you know, the, the, uh, the terms of the contract are or what the actual code of the contract is, right? Um, so when, when Alice says uh, zoe.make instance with this installation handle that indicates this code, um, what happens is that this contract makes an invite and then sends it out through Zoe. So this is the, uh, the invite that Alice gets. So we can go into that code. Um, so um, essentially what it's saying is that it needs to have this uh, format. And um, if not, then we reject Alice's proposal. And then um, the next thing to do is once we have this valid first offer is to make an invite for the second offer. So that's all that is happening when um, Alice does her part of the contract in terms of this, uh, this contract code. Does that make sense so far? Okay. And then uh, for the second part, it's a little bit more complicated. So for an offer to be matching, um, we actually have to check that uh, it'll satisfy what the user wants both ways, right? So um, there's a helper here um, called swap and swap actually um, uh, helps us do that. So let me see if I can. What is, where does swap come from? Yeah, so um, we wrote up a number of what we call helper functions um, to help the, the smart contract developers write things easier. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go into swap right now and we can kind of see what it's doing. But it turned out that this was a pattern that was um, used in a couple of our different contracts. Um, so we just decided to put it in a function that could be used on this on the contract development side. Um, so that people wouldn't have to rewrite it themselves. Fair enough. Well, where does it get imported from? Oh. Is it just mm -hmm. like, it's just in, in the imports? Uh, yeah, but, yeah. Oh, there's helpers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that it's yeah. there. That's yeah. right. That's Actually, the, that's we, um, we copied out the helpers into this directory. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, I think it's in here. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so we copied out the helpers into um, into this directory, but uh, just so that you can see what they look like. But normally you would import these uh, from um, the NPM package Atagoric uh, Zoe. Um, and, and we're changing how this uh, works a little bit in the latest release, so this will change a little bit. But uh, so let's actually go to swap and see how that works. How are we doing for time? Okay. Um, so what uh, what swap is doing first is it's checking that um, the first offer, what uh, we're calling the keep handle here, and uh, the difference between the keep handle and the try handle is that in many cases we have this offer that we want to match, and we're going to continuously try different offers to see if it matches. And if the second offer doesn't match the thing that we're trying, we're just gonna reject that. Um, so that's that's why we're calling one keep, the keep handle and the other the try handle. Um, so we can ask Zoe if uh, the first offer is still active. Uh, if not, if the first offer isn't still active, that means that the, the, uh, the assets aren't still escrowed, you know, we can't actually trade with anything. So we will reject that second offer. And then uh, the next thing that we need to check is whether the, um, the first offer and the second offer are actually a match in terms of whether they'll satisfy each other's wants, right? And in this case, uh, we know it's, the, it's an exact match. They actually want the exact opposite of each other, um, and they're going to be giving what the other wants. So uh, we know that this matches, and so this passes. And then um, since we know that it passes, the next thing that we need to do is actually reallocate for both of the offers. And so what um, reallocate is saying is that it's um, 
from the contract's perspective, the contract is going to ask Zoe to um, take the amounts that are in, um, in the database for both of these offers and just swap them. So what we're going to say is that um, the amounts that were under the, uh, the second offer, let's actually give them to the first offer. And the amounts that were originally for the first offer, let's give them for the, to the second offer. And so that's what this reallocate uh, call does. And then finally, we want to um, complete both of the offers because uh, we, we're not going to do anything more with them. We're not going to reallocate. And uh, this complete call will actually give the users their payouts through Zoe. Okay, and then um, what we're going to do is we're going to return what we call a default acceptance message to the user that just says like, hey, your offer was valid. Let's, let's actually see what it is. Uh, the offer has been accepted. You know, once the offer has been completed, please check your payout. Um, so the, um, uh, at the contract level, the contract is going to give informational messages like that to the user. And then from Zoe is where uh, the user actually gets the, uh, the payout in terms of the digital assets, the ERTP payments. Okay, um, any questions there? I'll go back to that. Uh, no questions? Okay. Uh, just a quick one. That's a, you know, this was from the conversation we had last time, but this works perfectly if everything's been minted and digitalized, made digital. Right. How would I, how would I defer completion that that is suppose there were additional things that had to be done before i could check to see that the contract's been fulfilled how would that happen here could it happen or is that yeah yeah so um do you mean let's see so so there are um let, let me start over so a, a contract um, can really only know about things if it's told about things, right? And um, the contract um, should really only care if it's told about things if it's told in some kind of credible way, right? So what you could do is have, um, you, you know the, uh, the invite that we saw before um, that was uh, given back to Alice when she made the contract? Mm -hmm. This could be associated with um, more of an admin authority that could um, have some way of um, informing the contract that something important had happened in the outside world. And because only Alice uh, gets this invite, no one else would be able to have permissions to um, inform the contract that that event had happened. So that's, um, that's one way in which the creator of the contract can kind of act as a, what we call an oracle in the blockchain space and uh, tell the contract about an event that happened offline. So yeah, so an oracle would have to say, this is a book in excellent condition. Yeah, yeah, so um, we, uh, I, I think that's right. So what you could do is um, instead of like, let's say you're a, a bookseller instead of you're not minting digital books, right? You're minting uh, promises for real books. So, um, right. or digital representations of something that will happen in the real world. Right. So, yeah, so in um, the smart contract and offer safety won't help, help you actually, you know, get a real book if that's what you purchase, but it will at least ensure that um, it's very clear that you've given money for the specific digital uh, promise, so to speak, that you will actually get a physical book in the near future. So, so is there somewhere where a, in some sense, an accounting record of all these completed contracts is maintained or? Um, that is a very good question. Uh, no, we don't, we don't have anything like that right now. Um, actually, when a, an offer is completed, um, it gets erased from Zoe. Yeah. Um, okay. Just checking. Yeah. 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 But I could definitely see how for, um, for auditing purposes and for future, um, you know, dispute resolution, you would want a, a receipt of that. You would want a record that that did happen. Right. So that's a really good question. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, like in the case of auto swaps, people are interested in what the the price history um, is, um, and, and it might affect what kind of offers they're prepared to accept, how much has been traded over a period of time. But I right. guess you could, if contracts can have some state, they could, they can store something if, if you, if that's what you want. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, um, let's actually look at the, uh, the simple exchange contract. We might have looked at it a little bit last time. I can't remember, but um, he, this is an example of contract state uh, or at least a bit of state. So this, um, the, what the, the simple exchange is doing, is just, it has an order book. It's a, it's an online exchange. So, you know, there's buy and sell orders and the contract itself stores the information about the current buys and sells, but you can imagine it also storing um, the, you know, past buys and sells, or maybe some kind of uh, summary of, you know, the smoothed uh, price over time or something like that. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's see. So, um, so let's go into the test for this. Um, so those of you who have gotten things running and you've been able to run the test successfully, um, this is what's uh, this is one of those tests that's running. Um, and basically, what it's doing is it's um, it's setting up things like um, the registrar, which, as I was mentioning, Joe, that's kind of like the way that we make private things public. So um, if you put something in the registrar, what you're doing is you're making it public to the world under a certain name so that you have this, um, this uh, common uh, knowledge of what this thing that you're talking about actually is. Hmm. Um, so this test code will set up Zoe, it'll set up the registrar. Both of these things will, are already present on our test net. Um, so I'll, I'll go into like what our um, what the testnet uh, scenario and development looks like versus the Zoe sketchbook scenario, which is much more simplified and focuses really on just the contract development. Um, but um, I'll go into that in a bit. Um, so we're setting up uh, the wallet with just kind of um, uh, the pet names for different issuers and things like that. Um, and we're setting up Alice and Bob with um, their initial money in this test. So we're gonna give uh, Alice three moolah, we're gonna give Bob seven simoleons to start with, and uh, we're gonna connect Bob and Alice with each other. And then um, the test actually kicks off when we call Alice start swap. And then um, Alice calls Bob with the invite and that invokes um, Bob's part. And then at the end, um, what we're actually checking is that um, both of them come out of the exchange with what the other had. So this is just a simple, simple example of the kind of test that you could write. And probably most of this could be copied and pasted with just you know, a few changes. And it would be sufficient for the kind of tests that you would want to write for contracts. When the, when the test occurs, is it occurring in code running in a server? Or is this all code running locally? Yeah, so this is this is all running locally. So this is, the Zoe sketchbook is kind of like um, the most stripped down version um, of things that we have so that you could focus really only on the contract development side. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like uh, right now we're going through um, quite a lot of changes, um, trying to get ready for our hackathon release that's coming up in a week. Um, and so with the sketchbook, we kind of wanted to make it as simple as possible so that when we're, you know, updating how our UI is doing and that sort of stuff, it's not affecting what's going on in the Zoe sketchbook. Um, but uh, let's see. So let me actually go into what it looks like when it's not just the sketchbook, because I think that's a pretty good lead in. So uh, we have the concept of a DAP. Um, and a DAP is short for distributed application. And basically what that is, is the combination of a Zoe contract plus a server that's running um, the back end and uh, the, the front end for whatever application this is. And then um, the UI that is um, running both on the server and then a version that may be uh, connected to your wallet. So this is kind of um, the whole like end-to-end -end application that a user 
might actually use. Um, we have we have a few examples of uh, of DAPs. Let me see. I think um, so. We have the simple exchange DAP. Um, so that's kind of like the order book example, and then we have the auto swap DAP, which is um, um, users are able to trade with a liquidity pool. Um, so it's it's based off of Ethereum's Uniswap contract, um, and I can show you what the uh, auto swap contract looks like, or uh, what the front end looks like, I mean. So, um, so in this case, we have, um, we have the purses from our wallet. So, uh, and this is just what you start out with um, in our application, at least the, you know, the kind of the demo version. So we have, uh, we have Moolah and we have Simoleons. Uh, so let's say that we're gonna trade, you know, 50 Moolah for whatever Simoleons and um, if this was actually working, this would uh, fill in with the price and you would be able to see the price per, um, per unit down here. And then you'd be able to swap. And um, once you swap, then it would open your wallet, show you this proposed transaction that the, um, that the, app, that the DAP proposed to your wallet and you'd be able to accept or decline it here. And uh, when you accept or decline, that's um, the wallet would actually make your um, offer to Zoe and handle all of that interaction for you. So from the, from like the end user's perspective, all you're doing is clicking on applications and then accepting or declining the offer that the application tries to make on your behalf. Okay. So, so it creates that, it creates that front end for how, how flexible is that? Can you, can you, cre you just create, um, yeah boxes yeah. and buttons to implement some interaction with the contract. Yeah, so this can be, um, the sky's the limit. It's, it's a completely open web development. So this is, uh, this is currently built with React, but you could use whatever it is that you wanted. Um, our uh, simple exchange uh, UI is um, a bit different than this, but basically um, kind of the same outline, I guess, you know, kind of boxy, you're just exchanging things, right? But you can imagine mm -hmm. this being, you know, a, um, a really well done, you know, um, almost video game type front end or something. It really could mm -hmm. be anything. Yeah. Yeah. So this is um, probably, I would say the, uh, the, the server that is running this is probably the responsibility of the person who's creating the, the smart contract, but not necessarily. Um, but you would imagine like someone has a business idea, they create the Zoe contract, they create, you know, um, this, this front end and uh, make sure that whoever is creating the wallet, which is probably a Gork, is able to, um, uh, to interact with that application. Okay, so um, so there is documentation on how to get uh, the DApps started and how to um, manipulate them and how to um, how to deploy contracts and things like that. Uh, we're very much in the process of trying to smooth out all of these steps, so I don't necessarily recommend you know going through with all this unless you just want to poke around, which you're welcome to. Um, but in a week, it'll it'll be much better. Um, Let's see. So I think that's pretty much all I wanted to go over uh, today. We kind of went over a lot. We're, like I said, we're still working on our Zoe documentation. Um, so are there any questions or anything that you guys want to go into further? OK. Uh, Bill, anything that you wanted to cover? Let me let my cat in. She's getting mad at me. <laughs> Um, no, I, I think, yeah, that's uh, like a lot to go through for the, um, you know, for day one anyway. So, um, we, at some point, maybe Kevin and I can talk about, you know, what, you, you know, whether you want to have an example to work through on your own that, you know, it's probably a good way to answer a lot of your questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, you know, maybe we can sort of attack that as some, you know, maybe even for the uh, hackathon project or something like that. Uh, yeah, I think the. I'm oh, sorry. 
Is there, a, maybe this is a silly question, but is there a way to do some kind of interactive debugging on the context so you can put in breakpoints and, and see what's going on, or does that not even make sense? Uh, yeah, so you, you definitely can. Um, right now, we only really have local debugging and not, um, not interactive testnet debugging because the, you know, the testnet only goes forward, right? You can't, you can't like pause mm. it. Um, but let me, let me stop sharing and let me uh, share the, uh, the VS code instead. Um, It's just, uh, yeah, it's, just, uh, it's often easy for me to see if I'm just run something to a breakpoint and then can see what's mm -hmm. going on. So um, have you used VS Code before, Joe? No, no, I haven't. Okay, so um, in, in the Zoe sketchbook that you have locally, um, hmm. there should be this launch.json. And what that is, yeah. is the, um, the settings for actually running the debugger in VS Code. So if you oh. go over here to this little, you know, uh, play symbol with the bug yeah. on it, that'll mm -hmm. allow you to run uh, the tests. And the, the program that you're running is just defined by this uh, file path here. So yeah. um, if I run this and let me open the uh, debug console, this is going to run the Baytown Bucks test. And I've already set a breakpoint right. here. So that'll allow me to go through, um, you know, as slowly or as fast as I want. And uh, I, perfect. I can inspect all of the values. So I can say, um, let's see, Baytown Bucks bundle or whatever it is. And it'll tell me, you know, what that is. Perfect. So just the, uh, what did you open to start that? It was in, in the VS Code launch JSON there, yeah. so and the, then you went to the debug, mm -hmm. and you have a breakpoint set there in Baytown Box, mm -hmm. um, which I won't have, uh, presumably. So if I put a breakpoint in there at 12, maybe, and then go back to debug and run. Yeah. And then what's it doing? It's not doing anything. So um, you can you can place breakpoints in the uh, in the Zoe contracts. Um, hmm. You can also so you can also so in debugger with a semicolon, and that'll add a breakpoint as well. So I'm just just to get to that. So I put a breakpoint in the same place where you have at twelve, and I've got. Um, the launch JSON from the VS, VS code directory and I run the that run with the de, with the debug thing on it mm -hmm. and doesn't do anything. Okay. Um... Let's see. Do you have um, Do you have the debug console open? So if you go to view, and then debug console, is that open? To view uh, debug console, there it is. Yeah. So now it's open. Okay. And if you uh, if you click run again, does anything show up? No. Okay. And your um, there at the top of your screen, there should be like a play button, like an arrow going over, down, up, and like a stop. None no? of that. Okay, I think, um, let's see, did you click uh, the run test play button there on the left hand side? No, and I don't, uh, I can't see that. I clicked the, on the left hand side, that like play debug button. But I don't have. I'm uh, just obviously not viewing. Okay. At the. Uh, uh, can you can you see my screen and see what I'm looking I at? I can. I, yeah, I can see your screen. Okay. So um, if the launch.json is set up right, you should see this run test possibility. 
and then I just don't have that that left that left pane with where you've got there with run tests. I've got say the, the you, code uh, there. Click on the arrow here again, the play button here. That should the play show. button. Ah. Yeah. It may just be hidden. Yeah, there we go. That there we go. And now I can click run. Now I click run tests. Uh huh. It just gives me like a tick thing for run test. Okay. Well, uh, we'll have to do oh, that offline, I think. Okay. Oh wait, there you did something. Here I am. <laughs> I've got. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's that's good. So that's re that's super helpful because now I can go yeah, into yeah. things and have a look. Yeah. Uh, okay. Any any other questions? So I think um, we still have to get the Windows environment set up for you guys. Um, and anything else that you guys would like to, to tackle next? I think in continuing along this kind of line with basic contracts and looking at patterns, for me it'll be once I can see how the what kind of patterns, how the patterns are similar across similar examples, that should be okay proceeding so, and uh so i think probably um the next meeting that we have we should have a uh, better zoe documentation with the help of tom um mm -hmm. so um we'll have that and then we will we'll also have the uh the how to install on windows and that should be helpful but um in the meantime feel free to you know let us know if you come across any issues if you have any questions anything like that it's very helpful for us to get feedback Okay, well, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thanks, Rev. Yep. All right, thank you. Bye.